So here we start um, with uh, my favorite portrait of Freud. Freud is represented in hundreds of uh, pictures, photographs. This is an actual portrait which appears in uh, the Bergasse Museum in Vienna, and I think it captures, for me anyway, something about the man himself. Um, I leave that for you to uh, resonate too. Now, there's no doubt that he fits very well into this series of great thinkers, and I would, his, I would um, venture to suggest too that he is the most original thinker about the human mind ever. And I as suggest here that William Shakespeare probably or virtually shares top spot because wherever Freud says something, Shakespeare has said it before. And uh, if you look at his 36 plays, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Now, a massive task. Sigmund Freud wrote voluminously and had thousands of ideas, literally. And they all encapsulated, as many people know, in his collected works, 24 volumes. This is the 24th volume. I photographed it. It's the most used because it's the bibliography. It's the index. This is where you find what you're looking for. But when you look at the contents, the major contents on, on, on the other side, uh, there's an enormous range of ideas, which we will not begin even to be able to delve into tonight for obvious reasons. So therefore, you have to do your own reading. And I suggest that if you want to know more about the man, I'll tell you a bit about him shortly. Read Peter Gay, the historian who is psychoanalytically uh, based in his historiography. A wonderful, uh, wonderful biography, I think. There's another one that has just come out, um, which, uh, is by, uh, which has been published by Melbourne University Press and is by George Macari, who is an, an analyst in New York. And I've just been reading this lately, and it's also a tour de force. So between those two, you should be fine. This is the Freud Reader, which is my Bible for Freud, for students particularly, because in 830 pages, you have the main, main works that are excerpted by Peter Gay into one book between two covers, and it's a mere $29.95. So you do not have to buy the collected works, and you have to read them, until you've read the Freud reader, whereupon you go further into the picture. Now, my outline tonight is as follows. Oh, Joy de Moussi, where are you, Joy? Joy has written a book, which um, I put in here. I couldn't get the cover in time, but I've read it, and it's about Freudianism in this country and in New Zealand, and it's a very, very readable book, and uh, I commend that book as well. Joy paid me $50, I think it was, for that. <laughs> Right, my aim and outline is simple, to promote your curiosity about his ideas. Those of you who know a lot about Freud may say, look, I know all that, but hopefully a new angle, perhaps. And those who have known about Freud but never read Freud, which is very common, uh, hopefully tonight will open up some new uh, perspectives. The outline, speedy. Wow, this is a mad dash, really, because we have very little time. Uh, particularly the crucial influences on his life. The second part, B, I'm leaving to John. Uh, we, we'll do that selectively. And the third part is the main part of my own address. Because it so happens that in September this year will be the 70th anniversary of Freud's death. And seven decades later, I think we need to ask the question, does Freud deserve all the attention or the vituperation, either way, because he's a very, very controversial figure still today, uh, that, um, that we read about in, uh, in various places. So my main um, uh, talk, in a way, main part of my talk is C. So quickly, as I say, a quick dash about the man himself, not so much recording his life, but more uh, what were the critical influences. And this is five minutes' worth. The two biographies will fill it in, of course. Here he is as a young boy with Jacob, his father, and nothing spectacular about this, However, with his mother, Amalia, the goldener Ziggy, Zigismund was his real name, and the oldest child of a family of six children, uh, and he um, is the star. He's born to greatness, certainly in his mother's eyes. No surprise that later on, when he develops ideas about the Oedipal complex, he relates this primarily to his own self-analysis, and tells us, very honestly, in the interpretation of dreams, that he and his mother were very fond of each other, so to speak. 
Um, the family, however, was a very, very well-functioning family, many children and an extended family as well, and uh, that's them represented there. The, um, I can come to this a bit later on in another context about his sisters, uh, which I'll do, as I say, momentarily. Now, here's a woman who changed the face of 20th century psychiatry and psychotherapy. Who is this? Anybody? It's his wife-to-be, his fiancé, Martha Bernays. Why is she so important? Because when they met in 1882, Freud had spent six years in the labs of Brucker, fascinated by things like the eel, the histology of the eel, and the medulla oblongata, part of the brain. He indeed would have been a neuropathologist or a neuro... Uh, whatever, a neuroscientist rather than a psychoanalyst if he had not met Martha because when he did meet her he was impecunious, didn't have a penny to his name, a mark to his name and he was advised by Brucker, his uh, mentor in the lab to forget about pure science and turn to something that would give him a salary like working as a private practitioner and that's what he did in 1886 upon marrying Martha but they, he spent four years earning enough money to generate a household. I don't think those things happen today nowadays. You just move in, but not in those days. Now, the father is an important figure here because uh, he was Jewish, an assimilated Jew, but um, very, very aligned to his Jewish identity and was very, I think, um, ambivalent about the way Freud was relinquishing his ties to Judaism, but thereby hangs a very complicated story which I'll mention again just briefly in a moment. And when he was 35, this is now the oldest son of the family, Jacob, who's getting old himself, hands him the family Bible, and in it is an inscription which says something along the lines of, you are the next generation, and he cites various Hebrew scriptures. He writes it in Hebrew as well. And uh, lo and behold, Freud uh, doesn't really pick up the message. However, when Jacob dies not long after in 1896, when Freud is 40, it's a momentous blow to Freud. Freud was absolutely, I think, uh, grief-stricken in every sense of the word. It was a void that followed. And interestingly, it also sparked off his self-analysis, the first psychoanalysis ever conducted on the planet. I'm not sure if Aristotle and others also did. Uh, did that sort of thing, but certainly in our concept of uh, analysing oneself psychologically. So, so Jacob is important in the sense of his death in, in an, uh, an ironic sort of way. Um, I mentioned religion a moment ago, and this is a very famous quote that he writes to Oscar Pfister, who was a Christian uh, priest, uh, and I'll leave you to read this, but... Um, it's, it's an ironic question about how somebody of his ilk uh, was the founder of something like psychoanalysis. But at the same time, he found Judaism irresistible and comments in this quote, in an address to a Jewish organization in Vienna, the B'nai B'rit, that um, there are two things about his Jewishness that became vital to him as you read the quote yourself, um, and I'll leave you to read it, it's, it will save me time. But this particular context of Judaism becomes ultimately very important to him, and again and again he refers to his Judaism as being influential in the way he conducted his life and indeed his uh, professional life. Now, uh, the other thing that was absolutely, um, in, uh, shall we say, uh, remarkable for him was the First World War. Two of his three sons served in that war. They came back safely and were not harmed in any way. But what he saw was the utter devastation, the thousands upon thousands of innocent lives that were just mutilated and, and, and lost um, on the, the battlefield, as we know. The, the First World War that created so much devastation, really. And uh, from that moment on, um, not that moment, um, look at the second half of this quote, um, I think he becomes very, very pessimistic about humankind. I feel a strong inclination to surrender my emotions about anti-Semitism. That's one thing that he fails. I 
fails to understand and possibly doesn't want to understand, but notice the miserable rabble. And in other contexts, he talks about human beings as being riff-raff, not very generous um, epithets for his fellow human beings. I'm not um, really surprised because living in Europe at the time he did, and obviously culminating in the, in the Nazi era of 33, moments literally after Hitler comes to power, his books are publicly burned in 33, the same year. And of course, Vienna, the Anschluss in 38, things can only go from bad to worse, culminating ultimately in Anna Freud, his favorite daughter, not his favorite, Sophie was, she died, but Anna, his loyal daughter, youngest, uh, being called to the Gestapo to be interrogated and um, thereupon he realized that uh, he had to leave Vienna, and of course you, you all know that he went to London for the last year or so of his life. This is um, a year before he dies, and I think here we see, this is the end of this quick um, life history, so to speak, but we see, I think, something of the pessimism that comes out. Uh, there's a quality here of somberness and gloom, he also had terminal cancer, which he had been struggling with for 15 or more years, of course, and that obviously played a big part in it as well. But I'm sure, if in, in my reading, that it was far more uh, the way in which um, human beings had behaved, in quotes, uh, that had uh, led him to feel this way. Now, I want to um, bypass this, but show you that I'm not unfamiliar with um, the main ideas in psychoanalysis, um, and they follow roughly this um, route chronologically, and the collected works also follow a chronological sequence, and they're very methodical and very coherent, but time will not allow this at all, unfortunately. Uh, as I said before, John will handle some of these um, issues later on. Uh, the ideas continue, and they end up in 38, just before he dies in in 39, September, as I said, uh, with um, his last two works, Moses and Monotheism, which uh, is a very, very um, sensitive thing to talk about uh, when he writes virtually that Moses is not Jewish and all sorts of other issues in that essay. Uh, and amazingly to me, just as he's about to leave the, the, the earth, he rewrites for the benefit of mankind a, brief, a briefer outline of psychoanalysis, almost to say, look, I've written so many things, I've changed my mind about all sorts of things over the, the, the decades that I've worked here, the 40 years or so, but this finally is what I think psychoanalysis is about. So if you want to read his final, if you like, version, that's the, the, the essay to go to. Now, I said that I'd spend most of my time on the legacy, and so far I'm not doing too badly, but I will have to just keep... Um, being very disciplined about this. Um, I want to look at the legacy in three areas. The method by which Freud studies mental functioning, the theory that um, he develops and devises, and then the treatment that um, comes out of it, although the treatment was the very first thing, so this should be reversed order, actually. So going to the method... Um, there's no doubt that the method that Freud adopted throughout his life was the incorrect one. It was very limited. But that was the work, that was the material that he had at hand. He was a private practitioner in Vienna, no access to fancy laboratories and the like. And so what does he do? He analyzes adult patients, of course, to earn the living that I spoke about before. And this is the material. We call this in our trade the clinical material, the clinical data. And as you well know, from this and from the case studies and from uh, minute observations of human behavior within this clinical setting, he derives a whole range of ideas. Now, the problem, the limitations are listed there, and I won't go into any detail here, but retrospective, somebody comes to us at age 38, talking about their low self-esteem and their problems with relationships and trust and so on, and you have to start digging and say, what happened earlier on and when you migrated to Australia and when, you, and when your parents got divorced and so on and so forth, it's all retrospective. It's not the way science likes to move. And so it's a big limitation. 
Similarly, the second one, Procrustean Bed, he's often been criticised for squeezing in his observations into his theory. Dora is a particular bad case, in quotes. In 1901, he talks about Dora and begins to write about her, publishes it in 05, and she is really a bad case of squeezing the data, the clinical material, into the theory. Um, and I'm not sure if he was altogether um, able to acknowledge this. The third point about colourful metaphors, as you know, penile envy, Oedipus complex, Electra complex, castration complex, all these very um, uh, flowery and florid and quite provocative and stimulating terms um, don't really create signs. I mean, they, they, they're more tied to the humanities, I would have thought. So that doesn't really get him any brownie points. And then finally, a very, very big um, criticism, particularly in the world that I live in, which is that of the therapies, he, um, he's accused, really, of using suggestion. He certainly knew that he was using suggestion in the early days when he used hypnosis for his five, four classical cases, and the fifth one with Josef Breuer. Um, but when he turned to free association, that is, the patient says exactly what's on their mind, without censorship and utterly without constraint, they may well still, and I'm sure this is right because I see it with my own work and with the work of my trainees, that there's a very strong element of suggestion about how you should think. This is uh, not, um, not um, denied by anybody, although we try to avoid it if we can. So, problems here. But, now this is the take-home message from my talk. Psychoanalysis is not Freud. Freud was the founder of this new way of looking at the human mind, but he was not the last. And what we've had for a century now are superb creative minds, I exaggerate the point to make it strongly, that very scholarly minds came to appreciate what Freud had offered them, given that there was very little else, the land was pretty barren, and gives them opportunities to tackle the human mind in fresh ways, but on Freudian foundations. And it seems to me that this would not have occurred, uh, the developments that ensued, without Freud being there in the first place. So I've given you some examples. Analyzing very young children, retrospectivity when you meet an adult, sure, but if you take a two-year-old and you look at their play, as did Anna Freud and Melanie Klein and the founders of child psychoanalysis, you see things as they are evolving. This is not retrospective, it's in the here and now. Uh, that turns to more systematic observations of this crucial phase of Freud's developmental theories about uh, infants and children, and uh, work such as the very notable work of Daniel Stern, looking at that early phase. Then we have experiments that can be conducted at that phase, sometimes regarded with a bit of um, trepidation, but John Bowlby's work, that, and I'll come back to him in a moment, and Mary Ainsworth, who conducted these experiments, um, showed very clearly that you can use scientific means to uh, track Freud's ideas more systematically and more deeply. I'll come back to Bowlby as my main example uh, just momentarily. Cultural and anthropological influences, Eric Erickson was a terrific thinker, and said, look, Freud was wrong to uh, reduce uh, the psychological arena to the inner mind, so to speak. Uh, he didn't pay enough attention to the external influences, and his beautiful book, Childhood and Society, tells us all about that. And then comparative animal behavior, the fantastic work of Harry Harlow with the cloth monkeys, and if you know that, um, is another derivative of Freud's ideas. And then perhaps the most important in today's age the neuroscientists, and here we have a very exciting uh, new chapter in psychoanalytic developments, and that is neuroscience marrying psychoanalysis and a new subject that has evolved from this called neuropsychoanalysis. And some of its major proponents are Kendall at Columbia and Mark Soames in Cape Town, and they have uh, done work, Kendall is the Nobel Prize winner in 2000, work on memory, with, with a, a snail called Aplysia, for example, which you think is very remote from human minds, but he shows very, very impressively 
how uh, memory is of different sorts, and the equivalent memories that you find in this sea slug uh, can be extrapolated to the human mind. And this has been shown now in neuroscience generally. So some of the ideas that Freud had about uh, repression and memory dysfunction, as it were, uh, are now being shown up in the lab. Quite extraordinary. And of course, uh, we have the technology now to do these things, as he did not. So here's a, a pictorial map, psychiatry, neuroscience, and psychoanalysis. And the confluence in the river here uh, is um, where it's all happening today. A lot of exciting developments. We can talk a bit about this later if you're interested. Now, a key question in all this always arises, and that is, is psychoanalysis a scientific methodology? And as suggested here, the debate goes on and on and on and the jury is still out, and we could spend the next two hours on this subject alone. But the, if I try and um, polarise the argument, we have Kendell, who's a scientist working on sea slugs for 50-plus years and wins the Nobel Prize for neurophysiology, uh, not for psychoanalysis, saying that psychoanalysis is still the most coherent and intellectually satisfying view of the mind. And um, having heard him many times in Colombia when I was there on a sabbatical just recently, uh, he stays wedded to this idea that ultimately the intricacies of the mind will be Freudian-based and that we will be developing the technology uh, as we um, proceed with um, scientific developments and this marriage of those two subjects uh, will flourish. That's his view. There's another view by a professor of English. I particularly put down his professorial role here. So I'm not altogether sure how professors of English come to have these views. But I don't know if you know the work of Frederick Cruz. Uh, it's the most severe and harsh diatribe I've ever read about Freud. And this is just some excerpts, a cluster of propositions derived from misleading precedents, vacuous pseudo-physical metaphors, mistaken information. He goes on at length. It's a, it's in, particularly in this article in the New York Review of Books some years ago, um, it's almost, um, it is an ad hominem attack. I think it's really quite uh, unacceptable. But there you go. This is the way in which these debates go. Now, it is true to say, and I'll make this very, very um, uh, illustrative, that some of Freud's ideas were actually um, quite odd. Um, now, for example, I don't know if you know his essay on Schreber, Judge Schreber, who went mad, wrote his autobiography. Freud had no real way of looking at psychotic mental functioning, and he, ad he admitted as much. He never treated one psychotic patient. He said that psychoanalysis was not able to reach the psychotic. Do you know what I mean by psychosis? People have lost reality contact. People like schizophrenia, people with schizophrenia and other severe disorders are like that. So when he writes about Schreber, uh, a fascinating essay, but total bunkum, as far as I'm concerned, and many other people have agreed. Um, he's taken this from an autobiography. He's never interviewed Schreber, and he does not know anything about Schreber's family life or he, other than what he reads in the autobiography. So, for example, he does not know that Schreber's father was a tyrant and that Schreber's brother suicided in his 30s. I mean, all these things are absolutely... Uh, essential to, to have in one's grasp before making up one's mind about psychosis. His own uh, conclusion is that Schreber was a latent homosexual and his paranoia is related to homosexuality, which has been repressed, etc., etc. Um, this is an interesting idea, but um, nobody really gives it credence. 